Good morning, everyone. So welcome to AWS Loft, everyone who is here and everyone who is joining us on the stream. So we're going to talk about uh, deploying your data warehouse on AWS. So I'm Pratim, Pratim Das. I'm a, a specialist solutions architect for data analytics for AWS. I uh, work with customers across uh, lots of verticals, but very keen to uh, discuss uh, your options on data warehouse on AWS today. Right. So how do you deploy a data warehouse on AWS? Not this way, right? Uh, this is a very traditional approach where you set up uh, you know, standby staging servers, uh, deploy your data warehouse, um, set up your BI application service, etc. However, there is a better, less expensive, more efficient, uh, faster, uh, you know, with less management headache approach, and that is going through the fundamentals of a data warehouse, all the different stages. So the ingestion stage, um, so here are options. Uh, you start looking at um, how, uh, how, how is the data coming in? Is it streaming data? Uh, is the data stored in a relational database? Uh, is the data stored in an existing data warehouse? Or is the, or, or the data is in a file server, something, and you have your own code, existing code you want to use and Adrian talked about using AWS Batch, where you can use, uh, you know, parallelly hydrate your data warehouse uh, from various sources. Um, and also, you can use services like AWS Glue, which is a fully managed, uh, you know, ETL service. We're going to talk through in, in details in a second. And the best practice on AWS is to store the initial load uh, data to S3, independent of the data temperature, the speed at which data is coming in, whatever source it is and you kind of start building something like a data lake. Um, and the next step for you is to work out um, how would you uh, prepare that data for analysis. Uh, at that stage, you are considering something called ETL, you know, probably the most commonly used uh, term in, uh, in computer science. Um, but um, and so you, you, you look at how complex is your ETL process. Is that going to run? Less than five minutes is a small transformation. Then you can use AWS Lambda. Um, if you want, uh, you know, big data style, fully managed ETL, you can use AWS Glue. Um, or if it's extremely complex, we're doing lots of aggregation, um, you know, uh, lots of, uh, you know, combining different data sources together. Then you want to use our managed Hadoop with uh, Amazon EMR. Um, that's a choice. So you've got various choices to do that. Um, and then um, the idea is to store the data again on S3 in a query optimized format, ready for self-service. So here you choose, uh, once the data is in S3, you can decide how you're going to analyze it. So let's look at our options. Right. So immediately the data is queryable through Amazon um, uh, Athena, um, and you can run SQL queries straight away, analyze the data, or you can think of a data warehouse style implementation using um, Amazon Redshift. Uh, you, we recently launched Amazon Spectrum. We can talk a little bit more details on this. And once the data is there, you can decide how you want to visualize it. You want to use QuickSight, or there are other partner solutions like Tableau, uh, Click, but, um, and also you can do uh, predictive analytics. But the key advantage of this, this structure is you have options. You have choices based on how the data is coming in and how you want to analyze it. And this kind of pattern would kind of cover most majority of the data warehousing use cases you'd ever have. Right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, Amazon uh, Redshift uh, architecture. So we launched Redshift uh, in, uh, on Valentine's Day 2013, so a little over four years. And since then, we've been uh, inventing like crazy. We, we're launching new features um, uh, on Redshift every couple of weeks. Uh, if you take a look at uh, Amazon amazon.com slash Redshift slash what's new, you'll see new features being published constantly. Um, so what, what is Redshift? Um, is, is, uh, is our data warehouse of choice? Um, you can start very small at 160 gig uh, in a single node SSD. Uh, cluster to scale up to like two petabyte um, um, using the console. We have some customers running about six petabyte data warehouse, like NTT Docomo. Um, 
uh, on AWS using Redshift. Uh, it is simple. You can connect through JDBC, ODBC using your favorite BI tool. Um, Redshift, Redshift is optimized for scans of terabyte and petabyte size uh, because we leverage uh, columnar storage, compression, and shared nothing uh, MPP architecture. Security is built in Redshift. Uh, you can encrypt your data at rest or in transit or isolate it on, uh, using Amazon VPC. Uh, you can manage your own keys using KMS, Amazon KMS, uh, or hardware security modules as well. So. Right, so let's quickly take a look at the Redshift architecture. Uh, the bit that you'd work with Redshift is called the leader node. And that's where you connect through your application, through your SQL tool, through your BI tool, over JDBC or DBC drivers. Uh, you can obviously download um, Amazon Redshift driver from Amazon's website, or you can also connect by Postgres JDB, uh, JDBC drivers as well. Behind the le leader node is the compute nodes. So the leader node gets your SQL, compiles into C++ code, and throw throws to the compute nodes. And we are continuously backing up uh, the cluster to S3. As we receive, um, yes, as I say, as, as we receive your query, you generate the code and distribute into the compute nodes. Um, and, uh, and also, I want to say, in the leader node has got things like the Postgres uh, catalog tables. And we also add additional uh, cataloging tables for you to understand how, uh, so for you to uh, query the metadata as well. So. Let's look at some of the common use cases, how Redshift is used uh, by various customers. One of the most common use cases, the main thing we are talking about, traditional data warehousing. Um, so you'd want to do uh, business reporting, advanced analytics pipeline in a secure and compliant way. Uh, you'd, um, you'd be, because Redshift um, you know, is MPP, so data load scales linearly with the size of the cluster. And so we have customers, we, I mentioned Entity Docomo, NASDAQ also, um, uh, who, who uses uh, uh, Redshift for their data warehousing. The other use cases you see is for log analysis. So Pinterest uses Redshift for interactive data analysis, uh, for KPIs, for recommendations. Uh, Lyft uh, also uses Redshift and Yelp um, for these purposes. Uh, the other use case is building uh, business applications uh, on top of Redshift and having many users on that. So Ex Accenture has a platform called AIP, which uses Redshift for its data warehouse. Infosys has got, Amplitude has got as well, um, uh, that uses uh, Redshift for many users. And they, they expose it to many users to use that as well. So uh, this is a whole list of Redshift's customers. The only reason I put this slide is for you to see that you know, it kind of matches with any vertical you are. You have customers you know, from... Uh, in a retail, from banking, from pretty much any industry you can think of uh, using Redshift uh, in, a, in public sector, education, uh, governments, uh, you, you'll see. So let's quickly look at Entity Docomo. So they were running on on-premises uh, Greenplum, uh, and they migrated to Redshift. Um, you know, they have 68 million customer, tens of terabytes of data coming in every day. They were experiencing challenges with scaling, performance issues, and they needed a level of security. So this is, this is the kind of architecture they built uh, with 125 nodes, DS28XL, 4,500 vCPUs, and uh, 30, terabyte, uh, or 30 terabyte of RAM. Uh, it's two, two petabyte compressed uh, data. Um, and they kind of got 10 times faster analytics queries with 50% you know, uh, reduction uh, in time for new BI application deployments. Um, and you know, they're, they're an extremely happy customer and their use case is publicly available on our website as well. And the other one I wanted to showcase is uh, NASDAQ. They moved from Microsoft SQL Server on-prem uh, to uh, use uh, Redshift as their data warehouse. Um, and uh, you kind of, they did that in, uh, in I think, seven, seven man months. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so they kind of get seven billion rows, two seven, sorry, seven billion rows of data every day. Uh, they analyze market shares, um, client activity surveillance, billing, et cetera. They needed to uh, you know, lower down their TCO. And this is the kind of architecture they built. And they use HSM. 
uh, to encrypt the data load from on, on premises to S3 and then they load it back to Redshift cluster. So that their cluster has got 23 node DS28XL. Um, so yeah, so that's some of, some of the matrix of it. Yeah, so yeah, seven man months, they finished the entire migration. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're quite happy with the, the performance they get. So when you're looking at data warehouses, one of the common things that we look at is performance. And how, how, do, you, how do you tune Redshift uh, for performance? So in the in Redshift world, throughput is not uh, about concurrency, but the effective usage of the MPP architecture. So the key things to remember is don't skew the work just to a few slices. Choose the right distribution key. Uh, do the minimum work. Don't pull out more blocks off the disk than you need to. And assign just enough memory to your queue or to your query. Uh, otherwise, you're wasting uh, valuable resources. So let's dig into each of those. Uh, all right. Uh, so doing, uh, how, how do you do um, equal amount of work um, per slice? So slice is a very important concept in Redshift. So each of the compute nodes has got two, eight, or 32 slices based on the node type you're using. And slice is a unit of computation and storage put together. And that is what gives Redshift parallelism. And when I say that uh, it, the data load um, you know, scales linearly, that's because the number of, every time you add a node, number of nodes, number of slices increases. That means more parallelism increased from data load from S3. And so let's, let's look at uh, the different uh, types of keys we have. Um, because that sort of, that kind of uh, leads nicely to the discussion of distribution. Um, so key distribution uh, is the first type. Uh, this is mainly used for your large fact tables, tables with billions, tens of billions and trillions rows. Uh, we use a modular operator uh, on, on a particular column and generate a key, and that decides which slice the data will land in. Um, then is you'd use, you'd also use it where you're using that mostly for the predicates, or also for those columns that are used in your group by queries. Next is even. Here we just do round robin um, and put the data uh, to various slices. And then you'd all, there's another option called all uh, here, and it's mainly used for small tables, so less than five million where you want the data to appear in every slice uh, for faster performance. Um, so now let's talk about how does Redshift, um, what, what does Redshift do to allow you to do the minimum amount of work to get the best performance out? So, we talked about uh, um, columnar storage. Uh, Redshift block size is one meg, which is more, more efficient um, and further reduces the number of I.O. requests. Um, and, uh, and because it's stored in a columnar fashion, it's the same data type, so it gets very good compression types. So we launch a new um, uh, encoding type called Z standard, which gives great uh, compression for char, varchar, and JSON strings. Redshift also has got an in-memory um, data, data type called zone maps, which kind of contains the min and max value of every block. So when you're running a predicate filter down, it automatically knows not to touch a particular block, and it hence gives great performance. Right, so that's what Redshift does for you, and what can you do to get uh, give Redshift the best performance? So here, let's talk, first thing we're gonna talk about is queues. Uh, Redshift comes with something called WLM, Workload Management. Here you can configure your queues um, uh, effectively. So I think you, come, you, you are allowed uh, eight um, queue groups or query groups, um, and you can assign a certain amount of memory and parallelism to each of those. Um, and you can do things like, you can, you can put some complex logic as well. You can say that like, uh, any long query uh, with a very high IO skew uh, in your query with a segment execution time greater than two minutes uh, and a skew ratio greater than two, I want to hop from that particular queue to another queue, or I just want to log it, or I just want to terminate it. So you've got very good granularity in terms of what controls you can put in place. So how do you do actual performance tuning? So 
that, that's a whole lecture on its own, so I'm going to skip and give you guys this uh, URL. Definitely take a note. Uh, if, if we are in the field and we are doing performance uh, analysis for a, um, a performance tuning for a customer, these are the five steps we follow. Uh, so it's, it's a great, great five-step uh, five playbook uh, anyone can use. Um, so now optimizing um, uh, Redshift uh, by using schema conversion tool. So SCT or Amazon AWS SCT schema conversion tool is a great resource. Um, it, it does allow to collect statistics. Uh, on, if you point SCT to a running cluster, it uses all the statistics there and actually suggests different distribution keys uh, if, if it thinks that you can improve performance by changing anything. So it will suggest distribution keys, it will um, sort keys, and it will also generate a PDF report. Uh, so that's, that's very powerful. Definitely use um, if, if you have a Redshift cluster uh, on a regular basis to see uh, if, if there is a scope for improvement. So I want to quickly talk through Redshift Spectrum. So this is a, a new functionality or new service that we recently launched. And so it's fast at exabyte scale. Um, and that, that's pretty, that's a lot, lots of data, right? Um, and is elastic, highly, uh, highly available, on demand, uh, and we kind of say minimum ETL. Uh, it supports standard Redshift SQLs um, and gives you high concurrency. So let's, let's quickly look through how does that work. So same process as the previous Redshift architecture diagram we saw. Um, so you'd, you'd uh, throw your queries um, from your BI tool or your SQL application, and the query then gets uh, compiled at the leader node. Uh, C++ code is generated. Uh, query plan is then sent to all the compute nodes. Uh, here, the compute nodes obtain per partition info to find out if the data is on S3 or if the data is on, um, on the Redshift itself. Uh, each compute node issues multiple requests to spectrum layer. So that's, that's the spectrum layer. Um, and for each slice, multiple spectrum clusters uh, are uh, assigned. Uh, here, uh, spectrum node scans through your data on S3. Um, and then at this stage, um, it, it does lots of uh, aggregation, predicate filter. Um, and uh, does things like joins um, and projections as well. Uh, and then finally, it gets it reduces the data set it was working on and brings it back to the Redshift cluster. Because we have less data now, and that's the best place within Redshift to do things like group buys, um, et cetera. So it, it, and then finally, uh, the results are generated. And final aggregations happens in the cluster, and the results are sent back uh, to the client application. So that's a quick, uh, the only, only difference was the extra Redshift uh, Spectrum cluster that gives you that capability to acquire files on S3. Uh, so we're going to try and do a quick demo uh, here um, on exabyte scale data. I'm, I'm only joking. So this is a, a, a screenshot uh, recording of uh, when, we did, when we did run the query. So let's, let's say um, uh, J.K. Rawlings is going to launch the 13th novel. Um, and, uh, and you know, a bookstore and to work out uh, how many they should stock, right? Uh, so, so let's say you are a, you are a bookstore of Amazon scales, uh, you know, billions and billions of products in your catalog. Uh, so this may be the first search you want to do where product title looks like uh, Harry, oh, just Potter and author is this. Uh, then you want to do something, uh, you want to, you, now you want to join uh, with uh, your daily orders, right? So, uh, so here we used uh, a, a, like 140 terabytes of data generated every day uh, over a period of 20 years. Uh, so that kind of get, gave exabytes. So that S3.D underscore customer order item details table is an exabyte table partitioned on S3. And so, right, so you want to do this, uh, and then you want to say that, um, right, so I, I don't, I don't um, uh, want to get all the results, but I want to find out my reorder point. Maybe the first three days is where the things run out, and that's where I need to work out how many I want to reorder. And so you, you put some, some date clauses in, you add in um, you know, some other attributes, other dimensions to it, 
And then finally you say, I want to restrict to my region. Maybe, maybe I only care about London. Or in this, this example, you use Seattle. Um, um, so yeah, so uh, and that's it. And then you kind of run your query. So this, this is a recording. Let me see if it works. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a recording simulation of uh, running this um, um, uh, on a screen. And let's see how long that takes. So just, just sort of comparison. So to run this query um, with exabyte worth of data uh, using a thousand node hive cluster uh, is going to take five years or more. And that's because we didn't uh, account for the extra shuffle at the end. Um, so, so let's see how long this takes. Um, but it, it, let's, let's, let's think about it. To, to get a result in a, in a certain amount of time where we could still be patient is it needs to be in a you know, mat matter of minutes. And in order to get a result that quickly, what do we need? We need billion-fold reduction in, in the data set, at least. Um, so so w w the, there are some magic um, that, uh, not magic, not, not uh, that Redshift Spectrum cluster does for you. Uh, but it's more science and engineering. So um, the first thing is the data is compressed, right? Straight away, you get five times compression. Uh, it's columnar format. Even though the uh, orders table had got 124 uh, columns, we are only selecting five columns. So straight away, we get uh, a good reduction there. And uh, this query automatically uh, Spectrum decides is going to launch a two, not launch, uh, is going to use 2,500 node spectrum cluster. Great, so we're kind of coming to a million fold reduction already. Now this clever engineering comes into place saying, okay, we're going to do some uh, static partition elimination because we are only deciding to choose a particular state in US rather than the whole thing. So US versus the rest of the world. And so that gives uh, a good amount of reduction. And then we do uh, some dynamic uh, partition elimination, and the Redshift optimizer works very well as well. Guess what? That gives 3.5 billion fold reduction. And let's see how our query is doing. So qu query is still running, uh, as you can see. And um, so you might be thinking, why do I need Spectrum? I don't have exabyte worth of data. Or you may actually do have exabyte of data. That's very good. Um, then. So let's take it. So on average, a data warehouse grows or doubles its volume, um, grows 10 times uh, every five years. We see an average Redshift customer doubles data each year. Um, and uh, other advantages of Spectrum is because you're acquiring data directly on S3, um, you are actually reducing some ETL requirements. So you don't have to load the data back to Redshift to, uh, to conform to a particular schema. Um, and then the other advantage is uh, various teams can use different tools. Someone can use Athena, someone can use EMR, and someone could, could uh, use Redshift Spectrum, all looking at the same data. Well, the results have come back, and guess what? It came back just less than three minutes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that was pretty incredible. And um, yeah, so it's, it's live recording of uh, um, Abhishek's uh, uh, screen. Uh, doing this query. Uh, so we, we basically, we had 190 million files, um, 120, 140 terabyte each over 20 years that gave you exabyte. So that's, that's uh, very powerful. Um, so we, we're talking about do we really need spectrum? Uh, so yeah, uh, the, and, and the other thing is it also gives you a level of uh, um, concurrency because you can have multiple teams using you know, different small Redshift clusters looking at the same data set and doing the data science uh, querying, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so the other um, element of a data warehouse is ingestion, ETL and BI. Let's quickly run through those. Um, so if your data, existing data that you need to bring to your data warehouse is in a relational database, then DMS, or uh, Amazon Database Migration Service, is, is, is the tool of choice. Um, it's simple to use, it's you know, minimal down, downtime, you can run in multiple AZs, it supports most uh, widely used source uh, databases, 
uh, low cost, fast and easy to set up, and reliable. Uh, and you can do a one-off load. You can do things like change data capture as well. So every block changes in your source database. And this database, source database could be your on-premises relational database or on AWS or on RDS, anywhere. Um, so you know it supports Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server. So there's a whole list of it. I can't remember the top of my head. Uh, definitely take a look. Um, However, if you are doing something like extending your on-premises data warehouse to the cloud, or you are bringing data from an existing on-premises data warehouse to um, AWS to Redshift, uh, this is a very good strat strategy as well. Um, here you'd use SCT, schema conversion tool. Schema conversion tools have got, has got agents that you will deploy and that in parallel would you know, do small deltas and load it to S3. It also manages the load from S3 and to Redshift as well. The copy command leverages uh, Redshift's uh, massively parallel MPP architecture to read and load data in parallel from files in S3 bucket. You can take the maximum advantage of parallel processing by splitting your data into multiple files and by setting distribution keys on your tables. Um, so that's another way to load data. Um, right, and then let's quickly talk about AWS Glue. It's a fully managed ETL service that makes it easy to move data between your data stores. Uh, AWS Glue integrates with S3, RDS, Amazon Redshift. Uh, you can connect to any JDBC compliant data source and Glue automatically crawls your data source, provided you give Glue the permission to crawl your data, data source and creates a catalog. Uh, it identifies the different data formats, different data types, uh, and it also suggests different transformations you may want to run on it. Uh, it runs, uh, the, the code it generates is Python, but it's all visual, but you can you know, flick back to look at the code itself. Uh, you can edit the code your own IDE. Uh, you can combine it with a notebook like um, Zeppelin notebook. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and uh, the other thing it also provides, it provides a scheduler, and uh, when to run the job, you know, how to get it triggered, etc. cetera. Um, so here I have, a, we recently published this blog where uh, to manage upsource into Redshift using AWS Glue and Sneakle, which is an open source SQL engine. Um, so definitely take a look at that and uh, yeah, so. This session recommend using your phones. So yeah, there are quite a few things that you may want to take note of. And, and then we also have a very, very vibrant partner ecosystem uh, with lots of ETL tools, right? Um, like Informatica, SnapLogic, Matillion. So definitely take a look at that. And if that's something you want to use or you're already using it, uh, you may want to continue using it as well. Uh, so in, when it comes to BI visualization, QuickSight is a very good solution. Uh, you can immediately, the, this, the advantage of using QuickSight is you can get started immediately. It's like a SaaS service, uh, you know, go ahead, re it's ready for you. You point your um, QuickSight to your Redshift cluster. Uh, if it's in, you know, in the same account, uh, then it'll automatically uh, dis discover it, provided you give the permissions. Um, and then one, one, of, one of the other options is maybe uh, you can use the in-memory engine of um, uh, QuickSight like Spice to bring in you know, some of the data sets for faster performance as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's quite popular. And also we have a very vibrant <coughs> ecosystem of um, uh, BI solutions uh, available in a um, Tableau, Tipco, you, you MicroStrategy, Luka, you, you, you name it uh, as well. Um, so when it comes to advanced analytics, where you want to do things like you know, UDFs, Python UDFs, machine learning, sort of data science, uh, we, we, we have a, quite a few uh, tools that connect, uh, allows you to do things like those, like R, SAS. Um, but if, if there is a particular programming language you think could benefit and uh, to integrate directly with Redshift, apart from Python, which we currently support through our UDFs, let us know. We'll definitely look into it. Um, so quick, quick look at the partner ecosystem. Um, so four types of partners. We talked about the ETL data integration partners. We talked about the BI partners. We also have a whole list of system integration and consulting partners who can work with you to deliver those data warehouses on, on AWS. Some of, some of them are here in the meeting as well. 
Um, and then we also have tools and products, partner products to do your query and uh, data modeling as well on Redshift. Um, just, just wanted to show um, this one. So on, on, on June 15, Forrester published the uh, Big Data uh, Warehouse Q2 2017. Uh, in which AWS is positioned as a leader, according to the Forrester, with more than 5,000 deployments, Amazon Redshift is the largest data warehouse deployments in the cloud. Um, so yeah, it's some, something to keep in mind, and uh, if you want to read the report, there's a small link to that as well. Uh, so now, a little bit of focus on migrations. <clears throat> so uh, take a look at this blog we wrote um, where we can do like Oracle migrations to Redshift. So Oracle data warehouse to Redshift migrations. Uh, if that's something you want to do, or if you want to extend your existing on-prem or cloud Oracle data warehouse to Redshift and you know, take care of the scalability challenges that you currently have, uh, this, this may be a very good blog to read. Um, and then I'd say that, um, yeah, uh, th this is, a, oh, I, I recently wrote this one actually, so Teradata to Redshift. Uh, is very good, so, um, you know, on-premises. You can run Teradata on-premises or you can run Teradata on AWS Cloud. But if you want to extend that to uh, Redshift or, you know, if you want to take advantage of Redshift, um, performance, cost, um, um, et cetera, uh, then this is, this is a good place to start as well. It goes through step-by-step -step, um, of how you'd want to set up the migration. Um, and then, I would, um, I would say this, this is another one uh, where you want to converge data silos to your data warehouse. So you can have multiple um, you know, relational data sources and you, are, you can bring all of those using DMS to a single Redshift cluster where you kind of gain insights which you couldn't do previously because you couldn't combine all those databases together. Uh, so that's a good, good block to read. Um, and then, finally, I would uh, love to invite you guys to come and join in the Redshift uh, Meetup community. Uh, the next session is next month, 26th of October. Uh, RSVP opens on the 6th of October. Um, and, you know, we normally have a very good, uh, exciting set of speakers from our customers and partners. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, kind of have an agenda. Ian Robinson is going to present the first 20 minutes talking about new features since the last meetup, which we had, I think, in July. Um, and we're going to talk, we're going to, uh, Kibula has uh, also agreed to present about the data science platform um, that built for their customers. And we're still looking for uh, another presenter. We've got a few proposals. Well, if you, if you want to propose a uh, talk and that, please uh, get in touch. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, uh, ready to take questions, really. Any question on Twitch? No? So, um, is there much kind of uh, DBA work for the virtual staff? Are there more things like collecting statistics on tables? Do you have any So, DBA work is not gone is reduced, um, uh, where DBA can focus on you know, performance and supporting business cases, bu business requirements, et cetera, uh, by, uh, by getting rid of like, um, you know, when a, when a node fails. And all, all those things have been taken over because it's a managed service. Those things are taken care of. Uh, but, you know, statistics are always generated and you can always want to improve performance. New business cases comes in and how do you support the business with this? Uh, you know, DBA functionality is still absolutely there. Uh, slightly reduced, you don't want to do, for example, patching, you know, patching a kernel or things like that, that's kind of disappeared, uh, but it's kind of more gears to uh, supporting the business and innovations. Um, oh, uh, our data is on S3, uh, and we use Hive to sort of manage that. So it's in an ORC compressed format. Can I use Redshift to look at that directly? Spectrum. So you can load an ORC data. I can't remember the top of my head if Glue supports it at the moment. Uh, I think it does. Let me check on that. And then you can use obviously Glue to ETL that back to Redshift. You can do that. However, if you have a Spectrum table, which is an external table, uh, so you just say create external table this and point to the bucket, S3 bucket, 
on Redshift, then that creates the spectrum table, and then you can directly uh, query the org. I think org, Parquet, Avro, JSON, um, all of these are supported, but just double check. Parquet definitely is, Avro definitely is. I just want to see, or I think it is. Spectrum is not available in the UK yet. <coughs> Coming soon. And we don't normally talk about um, in a, a dates, etc. But let's let's take this offline. And I'll, I'll tell you and tell you soon. Uh, Can you talk a bit about common patterns of scaling and sizing clusters? Yeah, uh, good, good good question. Um, so the, the equation changed slightly with the introduction of spectrum. So let's talk about pre-spectrum world and post-spectrum world. So pre-spectrum pre, pre, pre one, when you have a data warehouse, Redshift data warehouse, um, and see, okay, so you know, your database users have grown, your load has grown, your uh, BI queries have grown, you now need to scale it, right? So remember that playbook I showed you guys? The first step would be to... Um, absolutely step by step go through, oh, where is it gone? I think it's that one of the early slides. Uh, go through all of these steps, absolutely step by step, before you go ahead and do like add nodes and all that stuff. Um, and, uh, and then uh, at the end of the exercise, you may work out, okay, so I actually, I, I would get a linear performance improvement if I add three more nodes. And you work that out. So that's kind of, the pre-spectrum um, pre world. Post-spectrum world, if you have in your region spectrum, then you can start thinking things like, okay, so let, let's look at this additional load that I can't satisfy with my existing cluster. Uh, can I isolate it? Can I spin up another small redshift cluster with spectrum tables looking at the same data, right? So now you increased your concurrency and added more users, uh, but looking at the same data and producing different, all, even though it's the same data, but you're producing different kind of uh, analysis. So that definitely uh, increases. So yeah, so th think through this, but whatever you do, please go through all these steps and then make a, make a decision on what you want to do. So does it make sense with Spectrum to have a redshift cluster that's more compute intensive and storage? Good question, but not necessarily. That may well be the case, but not necessarily. Um, you, you could, you, you'd have to do that in trial and error and see how that works. Um, because you know, as, as, you, as we saw the breakdown of the processes, there certain, certain uh, sort of processing happens in spectrum nodes, certain processing happens on, um, on uh, the Redshift node. So the, so the best practice that I recommend when I'm doing a performance tuning exercise is to think backwards. Don't think cluster at all. Don't think anything like a cluster exists. First think, what is your query? Who is the consumer? What is the query you're trying to solve? What are the, so isolate all the queries. You normally see 90% of the queries are actually, 90% of the load is coming from probably 10% of the queries, right? So isolate those queries and see how do you satisfy those using uh, distribution keys and um, sort keys, et cetera, first. Uh, and then decide what you need to do with the cluster. That's the kind of second step to do. Does that answer your question? Any other question? I, I know we're a bit early. I think I did run a bit too fast, sorry. <laughs> uh, gentleman at the back first. Uh, yeah. So, so your challenge is mainly on the ETL pipeline, right? Uh, I definitely can recommend lots of things. Can we take this offline? Because I think that we have to go through step by step looking at where the contentions are and then work it out. And what tool set, for example, you are currently using to bring the data, data together. Uh, so we, even though we recommend SCT, and what we would say is uh, you would use SCT 
uh, to have multiple agents uh, looking at different schemas and different tables. So you split the entire pipeline into S3 first. Load the, so, so split, split the workload on your source Teradata um, into diff, different SCT agents managing you know, each individual schemas and tables and break it down and bring entire thing to S3. And once the data is in S3, then we choose the right tool set because then you get the advantage of the you know, uh, distributed object store uh, where you can do lots of tuning in terms of how you load the data to Redshift. But it's quite a detailed analysis. Not that complex, but quite detailed. You have to dig down into uh, each of the steps. Uh, let's take this offline after this. Gentlemen, sorry. Your question. No, no, SCT does all of it. Okay. The SCT agents are deployed, as so you can have multiple of those agents. Um, so let's, I think, uh, let me just close this. Um, so there are multiple SCT agents you install. Um, and uh, all of those, um, yeah, I don't know, where is the diagram gone? And so all of those would work in parallel and it will orchestrate the entire process. So it will get those changes uh, in sort of in many batches, micro batches, and put it into S3. And once it's in S3, it knows what's in S3 and it will load back that to those redshift. It, it does the entire process. Huh, interesting question, isn't it? Um, so what, rather than benefit, what, 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 what I would like you to look at is your usage pattern. So if you're doing an ad hoc exploratory uh, nature, you just use Athena first, because out of the box, it's just don't, there's no concept of cluster, it's serverless, SQL, immediately grow and explore the data. And your next stage would be, all right, there is some gem in this data. I actually need to bring it to my data warehouse, and then I want to expose it to my dashboard and get my CEO to look at it and you know, do whatever decision he needs to take. That could be a process flow. So Athena could be the first thing that, that does the first exploration. And then your next step is using Spectrum and Redshift uh, to give that uh, step. So kind of. It both ex coexist. There would never be in a situation where uh, this, I don't need this because you know, Athena gives you that agility and uh, Spectrum will give you that familiarity uh, with your data warehouse and your SQL, etc. Hey? Athena, is paper query or? Paper query. Spectrum is paper query as well. So both the same, same cost, same charge model. Yeah, so, so, you'd, you, so you, the first one, the key distribution, you definitely use for your larger fact tables. Uh, so in a star schema world, right? Um, so in, in a redshift world, a completely flat table is totally fine, right? You don't always need to think of a star schema. It's totally fine. Either, either is fine. Um, so, so if you have those you know, multi-billion you know, or trillion row tables, that's where you kind of think of key, for example. That's where you need that performance. Uh, so the medium size tables, uh, dimension tables, you, you think of uh, the round robin uh, approach. Uh, but if you have very small lookup tables, less than 5 million rows um, that you use in most queries, uh, then you might as well, you get extra advantage of Redshift having the, spec, uh, uh, having the compression. So you might as well put that in all, across all slices, and that's where you'd use uh, even, even distribution keys. So uh, how would you differentiate Redshift from, say, Snowflake? Uh, if someone has to make a decision and migrate into cloud. So because Snowflake also is Redshift cloud. So how would you differentiate? 
no, normally don't answer competitive questions like that. However, you think red, red, uh, red so advantage of spectrum. Um, so, sorry, the question was, um, apologies, the question was, how do you differentiate Redshift from another cloud data warehouse like Snowflake? Um, so Snow, Snowflake's key advantage is be able to run queries on S3. Um, and uh, with Redshift with Spectrum gives you the same advantage as well. Uh, so it's not about advantages, whatever you are familiar with, how uh, Snowflake is a very good partner of ours. Uh, we have customers you know, use spec um, Snowflake, we have customers using Redshift, Spectrum, um, all of those. So hopefully that answers your question. You need to do a bake off, you need to, you need to do a matrix and see what works best for you. Uh, there are certain advantages um, you know, uh, of Redshift um, and uh, obviously uh, there are certain advantages of the other product as well. So. Um, we don't have dates yet. So is there a release date for uh, uh, Spectrum in the UK? Um, all I can tell you is soon. Uh, we, don't, we don't have exact dates and we don't publicly announce dates. Oh, we can talk offline under India. So um, Glue is still early access, isn't it? No, Glue is publicly generally available. It's uh, is available in most US regions, I think four of those, um, and, um, um, and like Spectrum is coming soon to the EU regions as well. Um, um, what does that say about the future of the data pipeline then? Very, 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 very good question. Uh, can I take this offline? Okay. With you? Sorry, let, let me take your question. I, I think I, you deserve a little bit more uh, answer because of that. So, so differences between uh, data pipeline and uh, Glue, right? So as Glue stands, has been released in GA, uh, the, uh, the solution, you'd see data pipeline has got certain advantages because it does certain things uh, better. But if you look at Glue, how it you know, uses open source Python, how the pipelines is more visual and stuff, so that there are certain advantages that as well, uh, but you know, I would, you know, you, you'd see what what if you can cover your use case, current use case with glue. I would recommend you use glue. If you if you can wait until a certain delta feature that you need that comes into glue, uh, you might as well wait that. Yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Apologies, if you don't repeat your question. Uh, sorry, Last question, by the way. So is uh, Spectrum query to S3 regions limited to that particular region? Uh, great question. Um, currently, as it stands, uh, you can only run queries in that particular region. Obviously, think of the cross-region you know, query and stuff. Uh, whether it's going to be supported in the future or not, something we can discuss later. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, I can take any questions offline. And thank you for listening in. Bye to the stream as well. <laughs>